Hi, everybody. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're in uh, in YouTube and uh, you uh, can't figure out how to why we're not paying attention to your chat, it's because you're not in Zoom. And if you're in Zoom and you can't figure out why we're not paying, atten paying attention to your chat, it's because we're in Mukana. So you have to go to from from YouTube to Zoom and then from Zoom to Mukana to ask questions and chat. Um, it's just how it works here. So if you want to do that, go ahead and, uh, and 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 just click on the little. There's a little path. There's little breadcrumbs to get all the way there. Uh, if you uh, watch this panel and think that you might have better ideas than we do, you might, and we would love to have you as part of the panel. Uh, we're constantly trying to add to the brain trust that we have built up over the last eight months here. And so um, you're more than welcome to come if you'd like to test your system. I mean, all we really hope for is good audio, good video, and good internet. If you'd like to test that system, 6 to 6.30 in the morning is a good time to do that. Uh, we, we mostly test systems and, and just chit-chat. At, from 6 to 6.30. At 6.40, between 6.40 and 6.43, we, we do our mic checks or we start the mic checks. Once we started the mic checks, the panel is closed. So that's, that's as big as the panel is going to get for the day. So you don't need to raise your hand after 6.43 uh, or really, I mean, and I would recommend being here by 6.40. Uh, now we start at seven o'clock and we have general Q&A. So if you have questions about media production, about virtual production, uh, between seven and eight every day, seven days a week is a great time to ask it. Now, we usually then have uh, more vertical things uh, in, the, uh, in the second hour. Now, today, we're going to have just questions about video, if you have video questions specifically. Um, but we have lots of different things. Tomorrow, um, we're going to hear the story about how um, uh, Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer uh, was uh, recorded. <laughs> so Elmo, the, the, the original performer, is my neighbor. So we're gonna, I'm going over to get, get him set up with a good camera uh, today. And and he's going to join us uh, tomorrow uh, over Zoom. So, um, so anyway, so we're gonna we're gonna talk about that. And he ho I think he's 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 pretty ready to play a song for us. So it should be fun tomorrow. I would I would I would come. Uh, fri uh, Friday, uh, Christmas Day, we'll just have two hours of general discussion. Uh, Wednesday, we have a focus on education, and Sunday is just general discussion as well. Um, and so um, that's pretty much how it rolls. Uh, if uh, I think we probably have stacked up quite a few questions here, so let's uh, let's get started, Bill. We do, in fact. And the first one comes into us from Sean Johnson in New York. I haven't been able to join or watch the show lately, but I have heard something about Facebook portal bumping up the quality of a Zoom meeting. Can someone go into that in detail? I've tried it a couple of times, but I haven't noticed a difference, but maybe I'm doing something wrong. So thanks. Um, go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, sorry, real quick. Uh, con, please. Um, yep. But yeah, Facebook portal bumps up the meetings that, that is... Uh, uh, joined into up to 720p without needing a, a special account, which is pretty cool. And guy, there's no you've you've always seen it, right? It's 720. Um... Always, yeah. I tested it even with free accounts. So I even got out of our corporate account and made some Gmail accounts just to be sure it had nothing to do with our account. So it's worked every single time. Um, and the so, way to test yeah. that is really to look at what you go in to look at the, the statistics at Zoom as opposed to just looking at whether it looks better and see if you're getting 720. Yeah, the other thing is to make sure that they're pulling, meaning making the window larger. A lot of people look at the stats and they get confused right. why it's not working, but somebody has to pull on you. You have to expand the window to actually fill the screen larger than 640 by 480 for it to work. And there might have something to do with having more than two people in a meeting too. I think you got to have three people in a meeting for it to kick in, but... I'm not positive on that. I right, go ahead, uh, Chris, and then Jeff. Yeah, and the the pulling it larger, like literally, uh, I make I make my second display <laughs> a certain size every day, um, and if I just make it just a little bit too small, it doesn't pull quite enough. And so you really just have to pull that out, and and you'll literally you'll see the you'll see the picture get better, and you'll see the numbers in the. Um, in the um, video statistics pop up. Um, I almost never use a, 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 a aim in a Zoom meeting without this window open. And currently, Alex, I'm only seeing 1280 from you, but I'm seeing 1920 from others. It's, put, it's probably because I'm using a web presenter. I'm in, in uh, I, I am going to have my ATEM. That ATEM would be exactly Pro why we're seeing. Sitting here and uh, I had misplaced the power supply for my, um, <laughs> my camera so i can so we do a it, second hour on managing power supplies i just bought a new one anyway so uh so the um but i bought a new one and i bought a usp uh, here's the new one with a wall wart which is kind of nice because it's in the middle rather than that and i also got this as a backup i was like i tend to when i have problems this is great by the way it's USB C to the camera just so that any USB C thing will work all right you can get this on amazon anyway so when i, I buy uh, cables i always buy two 
Yeah, I bought two different kinds of them because I was just like, I'm never having this happen again. Anyway, go ahead, Jeff. So then, I want to thank Sean for asking this question because I have my portal here that is taken out of the box and has not been plugged in yet. Um, my question is, do you need a separate Zoom account for the portal? Separate sign-in? Kind of. What you'll have to do is you'll have to turn it on, go to the App Store. You'll have to... Um, log on with a Facebook account and then from, Ooh, and that hurt doing that. Uh, Facebook and then, or WhatsApp, as I understand it. WhatsApp uh, I think it. you can use WhatsApp. Yeah. And then from there you go to the app store and you download the zoom app <coughs> and you're good to go. I go, John but it logs in as your Facebook account, not no, a separate zoom. Account. No, you can, no. you can no, use no, your not at old all. zoom. You just have to download the app with your Facebook account, but you, I think you can all you need to do is put in the number and the password. You should be good to go at that point. Okay. John, it was you, fun. you can log in as with. many different accounts. So you could have a couple different Zoom accounts and log in and log out, just like a regular Zoom on your desktop. So, but yeah, if you're attending a second meeting, you can't have be logged in twice unless you have another special account. <laughs> Some of us have accounts that can be in two meetings at the same time, but that's a special request thing. But you should just be able to create a free account, log into the portal, go to another one. So like for a teacher, like a preschool teacher, I just gave, I donated one. Uh, so she can keep an eye and, on the kids in gallery view and she's in screen share view. And then she also gets the benefit of bumping up the resolution because she was showing the kids like these, like you draw it like this and you couldn't see it. Like at 360p, you couldn't see and the kids had to show their work and you couldn't see it. So I was like, all right, here's a portal, you know, bump up all your <laughs> meetings. So <laughs> that's great. <laughs> go ahead, John Ilson. The question on that power cord, uh, not every USB uh, wall wart will drive that, right? Because doesn't it need to be the power one, the USB PD or whatever? Um, well, it'll, it'll, um, well, we'll test it and we'll find out, but, but it should, it, it, it should be anyone that I, I, I use these guys, these are the, the little ones that I, I mean, this tends to be what I get lots of are, are these little um, warts that they come with the iPad. And that tends to be what I what I tend to use for those. Right, so. but that, I thought that was a twelve volt power on the camera. Um, we'll find out. I'll let you know. I don't okay. know what they're doing in here. I mean, they could be converting it. Um, I haven't tested it yet. I I literally just got it. It's been sitting on my desk because I because this one also showed up, and so um, I will. Uh, I'll test they, it. They make another one of those that is set up for the plug for the uh, mini. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna. Um, so I'm gonna. I'm gonna play with it. And, it seemed to get good reviews and I, I got it here and I haven't had time to open the camera yet. So I was working on something yesterday. So uh, I, I think it needs, it, it needs to, I think you're going to need the bigger uh, power, you know, like the one that you use with your MacBooks, but we'll see. Um, uh, next question. Moving on to John M. Gerard in Berkeley, California. And John says, what about being able to switch to stereo sound in the zoom iPad app? He's an attendee here. Um, does the Zoom iPad app have a space, a space to switch to stereo? I don't think it does. I don't think you can do that. Anybody, uh, anybody else? I, I don't think that the iPad app will let you. Um, uh, go ahead, uh, Jeffrey. Yeah, iPhone and iPad, unless you're using some a special device, uh, that is going to pretty much give you a mono a mono, uh, but I think it's uh, it's, it's not an iPad so. in general. It's 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 I, the Zoom app. It, the iPad is capable of stereo because we what we've found we found that the Zoom app doesn't give you stereo uh, even in headphones on the from the iPad or from iOS. The iOS app doesn't support. Um, but is he talking in or out? Out, out. This this question has come up before. You can't get stereo. You can't get stereo sound on an iPad, um, and so we haven't found a way to do it anyway. Um, next question. Moving on to Jeff Francis here in the panel from Columbia, South Carolina. Andy C, what headset are you using, and do you like it? This is a Corsair Virtuoso, and uh, it's um, it's nice. It's actually for for me, it's quite comfortable. I think there's always that subjective element to headset reviews, just on the shape of your head and ears and things like that. But I found that this fit me quite well. Battery can last me through a full day of Zoom meetings. USB-C charging uh, can charge up pretty quickly. Um, my quality is fine for teleconferencing. Um, 
I obviously I missed the rest of my setup uh, that I usually use, but um, today this was a fine stand in. Um, I had looked through a bunch of headsets in March when we were starting the transition to all of the Zoom stuff, and I landed on this one and I stuck around with it. Um, it's you know it is a little bit more of like a gamery headset. You have to go through and touch the equalizer a little bit to get a to get it to sound you know a little more natural. You have to turn off this woman in your ear that every time you mute or unmute the mic will tell you that the mic is on or off but once you get through that and I set those settings I actually enjoy it quite a bit I just thought you got it because the earphone insides match your sweater and I was thinking wow <laughs> well you know I have a whole wall of the you know today's sweater and ear cup combo will be and I pull that off the wall <laughs> uh hanky pockets we'll put a link for that <laughs> yeah I can find that by the Thanks. way, during our discussion, I, I did plug that into that little wall work and it works just fine. So the camera is um, cooking along. It's powering a drive. Um, I will hit uh, record to make sure that it's not. So I'm now pushing the camera about as hard as it goes. That's, <laughs> you know, that's, so that's nice to know. That's, that's really cool. Yeah. So it uh, really is cool. So this is the little, the little iPad wall work. Um, 29, 29 amp, I think, or 18, watts, or 18, 18 watts. 18. And it seems to be enough for the camera uh, to run. The camera is not complaining um, and it is uh, recording, you know, raw things that usually drop a lot of power. I did take the battery out <laughs> waiting for someone to ask, did you take the battery out? I did take the battery out. Um, go ahead, uh, uh, Jeff Francis. The other supply you got, the brick on a rope, was that for the camera or was that for the A10 Mini Pro? Uh, this is for the camera. This was another oh. one. The, the A10 Mini Pro is actually really... A normal power supply i've got if you if you have any 12 volt black magic power supply that ends in that ending which i have lots of uh you, you can plug any of those in it doesn't have the screw on but it has any of any of those will work it's the camera that has the funky one and so i end up with this kind of growing collection of ways of connecting to it so that i um that, because there's no way to go to a store and just pick it up go ahead mickey yeah, I've powered the atem mini uh, and mini pro off a uh, 14 volt lithium pack and all good yeah yeah it's 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 pretty it's pretty easy to easy to do that so that's easy to, the, that was easy to handle it was the camera so i'm on the ursa right now but i was but i got i need the ursa to go test other things with so um uh, next question moving along to james babbitt from here in san diego and he says what video editing software on the mac would you recommend to make short clips from a youtube recording uh Go ahead, Bill. Well, you got a lot of choices. And so I, I, some of them I use, uh, some of them I don't use. If you just want to clip something, start with a couple of free things. Um, uh, QuickTime Pro will do a, you can set an in and out point and get rid of everything else. And so that will make a clip for you to your desktop. There is a little program called Clips that I have never opened that uh, I think may have that capability. It's a free one, I believe, from Apple that comes pre-installed on your machine. And then um, if you get up into the thing, iMovie will certainly do it. And of course, my problem with not using any of the smaller ones is I'm spend most of my day in Final Cut Pro. And once you, you learn a tool like that, you just stop using other things because it does everything. You can definitely do those clips on the YouTube. I, I will admit that I'm, I tend to be very, uh, I tend to grab almost everything and just pass it through compressor and just make it into Apple ProRes. Then I start cutting. I don't bother with the, whatever comes to MP4s. Just, there's just all kinds of weird stuff that can happen. And you start, you think that it's going to be a simple little clip and then you turn it into a real edit and then you wish that you had started with real, real footage rather than. So the first thing I do when I download stuff of YouTube, if I'm going to do any work with it is convert it to Apple ProRes. LT, if it, you, LT is going to upgrade it way past what YouTube had. So you don't really need to go like 422 or 4, uh, HQ or anything else. Just LT is fine. Um, but then uh, just convert it to that and then you can put it into anything. It will pro, uh, Final Cut, Resolve, um, iMovie, all of those will take the straight what you downloaded, but the frame accuracy and some other idiosyncrasies can can occur if you if you start to um, just just cut the MP4. So that's my not only only word of word warning. You can definitely do what you're talking about in iMovie, uh, Final Cut, Resolve. Resolve is going to be kind of if you're just getting started with editing and all you want to do is do some clipping. <laughs> I think Resolve would be taking M1 Tank to the grocery store. Um, Bill. 
And just the other tools, two tools that I think everybody who does a lot of video should have in their kit. VLC is an open source video parser that opens darn near everything on the planet and can convert it to darn near everything else. And for anything the VLC doesn't work with, there's a program called Handbrake. And I don't know if they've made that 64-bit compliant now, but Handbrake mm -hmm. would do anything else that I found VLC didn't do. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Next question. Moving to Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas, who says, my Logitech Brio turned blue for a while. Give it oxygen. What's up with this? No, the camera itself didn't turn blue, but the image did, for your information. It did this after a firmware update. So, And did it come back to normal? Normal. Uh, after okay. I uh, went into the uh, app, the Brio app. My guess is, is that it, it was asking, the new update was asking for some state that didn't exist in the camera, you know, from the older, or didn't exist in the previous, you know, there was, a, there was probably a, a bit that was flipped that doesn't exist anymore, or that was now, now being misinterpreted. And as soon as you asked it to do something, it figured that out. Yeah, this is, just, I'm, on, I'm on the Brio right now. It's fine. But has, it, has it happened it. after that? After the, it, has, it hasn't happened after that original firmware? No, not at all. Yeah. Not at all. I, just, I think that was a mismatch variable. <laughs> you know, like they just didn't, you know, like like the the the, the firmware created a, either a hole or created a new a new request that didn't exist in the last one, and it just needed a moment to it needed to reset. Probably if you had unplugged it and plugged it back in, or restarted the computer, or turned on the Brio app, any of those things probably would have reset. The, the, the unplugging, variables. plugging back in didn't work, but the, just going okay. into the settings did work, and I, what and the camera itself did not turn blue. By the way, <laughs> that, that would have been crazy. Uh, next question. <laughs> Next question comes in from Jonas Dattel of Reutlingen, Germany, and he says, um, can the new cam from Jeffrey Powers be con controlled via Zoom? Are we able to re request control of that, Jeffrey? We'll try. I don't know. Uh, the cam he's talking about. Okay. Uh, da, 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 approve. No. So this is the OBS Tiny, by the way. No, not getting any, uh, not getting any controls. So I think that... I think Greg just tried to do ask for control. If does your control stop if somebody else asks for control? Uh, I don't think so. I think I think you can have multiple people. But does anyone see it? I don't know if anybody sees uh, control. It probably doesn't it doesn't probably have uh, the standard standard controls that yeah. are required. So the so one question I had for Zoom is you can control Zoom. You know, uh, you can control the zoom and pan and tilt in a Brio. If you had like three Brios connected to one computer, could you control? Could you switch between all those computer, all those cameras, and control their uh, pan tilt zoom it, remotely? Yeah. Uh, go ahead, guys. Yes, you can. There, there's a little switch camera icon that appears in the top left, and then you would click on it. And there is a little bit of a glitch, so it's not like a smooth uh, mm -hmm. switch, but it it'll go Brio one, Brio two, Brio three, and you can just say uh, zoom in, pan tilt. And yeah, that That's works cool. even with, we have some 12X uh, UVC based USB cameras and it works with those as well. So you can really push in with a, with a real optical zoom. It's pretty cool stuff. Guy, are you, using, Guy are you using the native uh, Logitech app to control the Brios? I'm not using the Brios actually. I'm using or, at, at the office, we have a Lumens 12X PTZ and that's the one that we can really push in with. And then I have the huddle cam up there. Great. Next question. Uh, Tim Lewis of Marshville, Missouri says, our Canon C70 should make its way off the FedEx truck today and be in our hands. Has anyone had the opportunity to use the C70 yet? Any insight? I don't know if anyone's used it. I'm actually not even... Let's see your C70. Whoa. That's a lot of camera. Well, I, I wait for a good report. <laughs> so that's that's a, that's a, you know that's a, that's that's a lot of camera there. It'll be it'll be interesting to see uh, uh, what kind of we're 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 expecting you to um, now that you've asked and you've told us Tim that you have one of these. We will be expecting a full report later. Maybe even have you on the panel talk about. Is that it. something new in the Micro Four Thirds line? I wonder. Uh, no, I think it's full frame. Is it full is frame? It? I think. Oh yeah, I think this is this is like oh super super thirty five. Sorry. Or the features are super thirty five, but I, um, I thought, yeah, this is this is the there was the there's a couple new Canon cameras that are kind of these hybrids, which are very close to 
video as well as really high end uh, still. And so, um, yeah, I'll be uh, super interested. Go ahead, Stuart. Yeah, this is the one that I mentioned several weeks ago that is available with the extra quarter 20. So you can run the sensor as 916. And I believe you made a fair argument against doing that because of the resolution drop. Well, I think that what I, I think what I, um, it wasn't so much the resolution drop. I think that the, the main thing I think my point was is that if you have the resolution to capture it vertically, why not just capture it vertically? I mean, I mean horizontally, just capture it horizontally and then cut into it because you're, you can't get more resolution out of the, the 9 by 16 uh, services. So it didn't, um, didn't make as much sense to me to do that. Um, I'd rather just protect for it. And then because I do I, the stuff I've done, I've done almost all of it with in 4K or 6K and then just pan inside of it and you just get more data to work with and rather why why box yourself into a nine by 16 i guess if you're doing a live output and you wanted to put it out there as nine by 16 it, it might make sense go ahead sky well we're finding that exact case because we want to use a larger file size so that we can use the option of vertical or horizontal because you only get that one performance that one time and we're just trying to get that second performance vertical versus horizontal it's just a lot of extra work so if we could get a big file and then crop it and chop it the way we like or what or, oh. sorry way the end needs it or wants it that'd be great i think that i mean if you look at what quibi was doing and maybe someone else will pick up from where they were going now that they're they burned up a billion dollars uh was the idea that you could put up an image with metadata so you have a nine by 16 image with metadata of where the pans are for or, or 16 by 9 with metadata where nine by 16 lives in the side of there. So you build your whole edit in there and then, and then move the viewing screen around to do that. And that, what that would allow you to do is if a viewer turns like this, it automatically gives them the nine, the full nine by 16, but if they turn back vertically, it it's a pan and scan, but it's done in metadata, not in, uh, not in the actual um, yes. cut. And, and that's really the way to do that. Go ahead, Chris. I'm wondering if part of, Quibi's demise was that it kind of <clears throat> came out right when we were all locked at home and didn't have to stand in line at Chipotle watching entertainment on our phone. I think that, I mean, I think that they had a bunch of problems. <laughs> I think that one, uh, I think one problem that they had was that they, char they wanted to charge too quickly. So almost all the other services give you 90 days. Uh, Apple gives you a year if you buy something from them. Um, for the services. So you didn't have to commit to the service very quickly, um, you know, for most of these other ones, and we already had them. So for them to say they're only going to give you seven days to figure out whether you like them or not. I know for me, that was like, mm, I'm not doing that. Like I literally turned it on and, and I saw seven days. I was like, I'm not gonna, I'm not, you know, like, that's not, I don't have time to, to figure that out, you know, and, and I have to admit that they also came into it where I think more people are more sensitive about subscriptions than they were before. I know I am. Like I'm pretty ruthless about subscriptions, um, uh, uh, you know, that I, I delete them. Cause I, I suddenly realized there was one day a couple of years ago where I realized I had like $130 a month going out to subscriptions that I wasn't using, you know, like just weird apps that were $7.99 and $13.99. I wasn't paying attention to it. I was thinking I had turned them off and I hadn't. So when I looked at all the subscriptions, I realized I was just bleeding money. And so I turned off everything, turned, hand, turned a couple things back on. And then now I check it every month. I got a little reminder that pops up and says, check your subscriptions. <laughs> And I uh, delete a bunch of them, you know, it, even if I don't think I'm going to use them. Like if one is like a one year subscription, I sign up for it. I, I wait a couple of days because I'm paranoid and I just delete it. Like I, I turn it off because it, it'll run to the end of the subscription, but it'll force, it means that I won't forget about it later on another yearly, you know, if it's 80 bucks or $130 a year, it won't come back up automatically and re-up. It'll, it'll ping me for it. Um, and I can decide whether I'm using it or not. I think so, it would be a great service to humanity for you to share how you, 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 you found all these things. You said you, you went to one screen that showed all your subscriptions. Oh yeah. There's a screen in your, in your, in your, in your in, yeah, there's I'm a not screen. saying there isn't, I'm just saying, oh, I don't know where it is. Yeah. It's in the, yeah, it's in your, it's under your Mac dot Mac, whatever. There's a list of everything that you're subscribed to. In one all right. Place. I'll be busy for a while. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it's super useful. I didn't know it was there either. Um, and, and I was like, what? We talked about it on Mac break at some point. And I was like, there's a whole page of this. And it's the key to the operation. Cause you find out, and that's under, that's under your uh, uh, Mac, your, like your iOS or your iCloud, right? Felipe. Is that under your iCloud? Yeah. 
Yeah, it's under. If you go on the on the phone, you can you have access to the same list of subscriptions if it in, if it's for the Mac, mm -hmm. and I do exactly the same. As soon as I subscribe, I go there and I cancel it, because yeah. then it it forces me to. If I really want to go to continue, I go there and I subscribe again, and right. I put a calendar reminder as well in case I don't. Yeah, and so it was. I think that was part of it. I think that they over it was overproduced. You know, I think that we wanted to have we thought we wanted to have overproduced, but I think that the social the folks watching social media. What, what, what is that? Is that Quibi? It's my Quibi is, it has expired. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, check your, if you don't uh, subscribe through those services, check your credit card uh, statements every month to look for those repeating things. And uh, this is a great reason to have your credit card uh, compromised and change numbers because then you have, get those messages that they can't repurchase your subscription. Yeah. yeah. Uh, go ahead, Bill. Sometimes, and I will just say this because I ran into it early with the, the subscription. Um, I was told by my banker that I'm not a, uh, that that the bank the bank card company was not a party to the deal, and that this contract specified only binding arbitration. So I could not get subscriptions stopped for a but little that's while. With a, but that's with a bank account, not with a credit card. No, the credit card. Were, credit card was issued through the bank. But I just. I just canceled the credit card. For a while, I started buying uh, grocery store de uh, cards like vanilla cards and putting all my subscriptions on them because they run out of money and nobody can do anything about it. Anyway, just <laughs> subscriptions are weird. Yeah. So so anyway, but I think that Quibi, you know, I think that uh, it's pretty traditional for a lot of folks that are in the media industry to not understand TikTok. You know, to not understand that there's a there's a way that that gets done, and there's a way that social media gets done, whether it's YouTube or TikTok or other things that that you have to kind of there's a bottom up kind of ground. It's very very hard for a big company to build things and really understand the market that they're building into, you know. And so they they built. I think they they split the difference where folks in that aren't used to TikTok or YouTube or whatever don't really get why they'd watch something on the phone, and the folks that do watch TikTok and YouTube don't really care about adult, you know, like that grown up old people video. <laughs> you know, like, so there's like this, there's, and, and they just, they just cut right through that right in the middle, put their legs on both sides of that. And it just, I don't think it just didn't work. Um, so I think that that was probably the, the problem. Um, next question. Paul Wallace from the panel in Austin, Texas is in with, will any gamer headsets cut it for the audio standards of office hours? He has a Logitech G933 that he might be interested in using. Uh, in general, no, um, but but you know you might. And Andy's on the outer edge of it. Sorry, guys, <laughs> it's it's not bad. It's not bad. Um, it's it, it would be an Andy's would be enough. Um, but we would go. Well, it'd be really nice if you had something a little nicer. But but it would be. It's just that it's full. It's the spectrum. And so one of the things that'll happen next week that once I get the Mac Minis up is I'll start. We'll have people when we're doing mic tests. I, what I want to show you is what the spectrum of your. So in addition to the WLM, my goal is to put up a little. Uh, spectrum analyzer so you can see what the spectrum of your mic is you know what it's covering you know in your as you're talking and then we can start you'll start to see why the gaming headsets are a little tinty um and this is even you know a little tinty compared to like a, a pr40 or whatever um so it's just a matter of figuring out what that is but but andy's is fine um that would be that a gaming headset that's a high-end gaming headset would be fine the um uh people's your AirPod Pro, AirPods will not be fine. <laughs> Neither will your internal, you know, internal speaker. So those are the kind of things we're trying to get away from. The the, the but gaming headsets will probably be okay. But if you have a really good mic, uh, I guess my whole thing would be why you know uh, why not use it. Nope. Next question comes from Guy Cochran of the panel in Seattle. Uh, panelists, can you recall a specific time that office hours improved your production? Right, go ahead, Jeff. I have several of these. Um, so I put together three uh, streaming systems for three of our venues, 200, 500, and 2,000 seat. And so lots of questions were answered about PTZ cams and switchers and SDI cabling construction. And I met uh, Jeff Keithley, 1F Jeff, and uh, he talked to me on the phone for about 45 minutes talking through a remote uh, control of those things. So that helped me set up a local production network that was separate from the rest of the world and a computer that bridged the two of those. 
um, another thing that it gave me was the the ability to go when someone was asking me to do a webinar that they wanted it to be hybrid. And I was like, no, let's let everyone be virtual so that everybody's the same. And I stood my ground there and it worked much better having that situation. Alex, you muted. Sorry, Stuart, and then Jeffrey. Uh, two occasions. First one was first time I was put through ruthless reviews because the criticism was done uh, in a respectful manner, which we seem to be quite competent at doing uh, because a lot of people will just say something is bad because they're being nasty rather than saying why technically. And the second would be uh, the first time Chris Fenwick actually complimented my lighting. <laughs> Which I think looks great today. Yeah, it looks great. And uh, I love the black limbo over the, uh, the sheet that you use on occasion. Uh, Jeff, Jeffrey. It looks like you're in a, it looks like you're in a studio. Yeah. Two things for me. One is the portal. Uh, I wouldn't have bought a portal if it wasn't for the fact that I could actually do it. A zoom meeting in 720 and I, and that helps with my, recordings and the second thing i just noticed with this obs bot this new camera is it has ai gestures so if you raise your hand it's supposed to set it up so it'll follow you and it, as i was sitting here doing that it was trying to figure out if if I, it wanted me to follow or not follow <laughs> uh bill uh go ahead bill and then sky well i just think that i you know i had used zoom over the course of two years before office hours, maybe four or five times for specific clients. Usually it was a school district we were talking to for something. Um, but getting up to speed so rapidly because of office hours and following Alex's standards got me so far along that I'm actually now for about three of my clients doing work where I'm recording off of uh, various meetings, whether it's WebEx or Zoom and stuff like that. And none of this would have happened if I hadn't had the privilege of being on this panel and listening to everybody solve problems over and over over again that I ran into when money was on the line. So thank you, everybody. Yeah, yeah, I think that it's hard for me to put my finger on specific things other than in general, uh, to, to Bill's point, I just feel like I'm wiser. Like I just know what all these things are and, and, and I don't always understand it all either when someone first mentions it, but then it, 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 as people keep on talking about it, it's all, it all sinks in and then it just becomes part of how you think about a project. Is, is there's all these little bits and pieces that you just didn't know existed in uh, sky and then guy. Well, guy, I do blame you and credit you at the same time for bringing me into this because you gave me the opportunity to, to, to learn and continue to learn and continue to test these things for my church, for Madeline, for Graham care, for my, uh, so that uh, I have so many experiences guy. So uh, thank you. And uh, again, the whole room, thank you for continuing to help test, not just because the marketing guy says you should buy it, but because it's a product that actually fits the need. So square, square peg, square hole, it's working well. Thank you. Good guy. Yeah, two things. One would be this little gem from Tucker. Thank you so much for introducing me to the world of comms. Even last night during our Christmas party, I had comms on and I was able to, in the back channel, uh, alert somebody to change something, which I didn't have to yell across the room, you know, in front of 17 it's people. Just, so it was it's nice so great that comms. we're using comms in our Christmas party. Like, just like, <laughs> Christmas party, hello, comms well, yeah, in the we, background. We, everybody needs comms, right? And then the other one is just starting early. I mean, Mentally, I just would have never thought that that would make such a huge difference, but it's, there's a certain peace and calm that you have if you start 15 minutes early with the pre-show and you're just rapping with the guys and just, it, it flows so much nicer. And if something blows up, you got 15 more minutes to fix it. So yeah. <laughs> starting early is huge. That's a just game changer for me. That's great. Um, go ahead, uh, Roscoe and then Chad and then Brian. Yeah, I mean, the powers above decided that we were going to use Zoom and I didn't know anything about it. And people think I'm brilliant now because of this group. Because just the stuff that just kept coming in weekly, you guys, you guys are just answering question after question and feature after feature. That was just like, wow, it can do that. So, I mean, thank you, thank you, and thank you. Chad? I started incorporating the WLM meters to normalize the audio. Our, our, my clients sound a lot better now and more consistent. I have noticed, though, that uh, doing it secretly in the background, I get better results. Um, and then I'll put up the numbers and I'll say, okay, we're going to do sound checks. And they, they're lower by like 3 dB because they're paying attention to the meter. So I, I end up going with the numbers from where I'm secretly doing it while they're in conversation. Great. 
uh, uh, Greg and then Brian. My, my first exposure to this group was uh, Mickey invited me to, um, to, to listen in on, on a session when you had Jimmy uh, Siska on as a guest mm -hmm. and uh, because we're all, we're all friends. And, um, and I, I took one look at the panel and, you know, after 45, almost 50 years in the business, you think you might know a thing or two. And um, I was just I was just shocked. And I'm like, oh, man, I got to step up my game. Look at these guys. No, I mean, it, it just reeks pro, you know, and, and, and it's just it's the whole ism. And um, so, number one, I want to I want to you know thank you guys for that. Mickey helped straighten out my audio chain. That was that was really good. Once again, these these students surpasses the teacher. Gotta love that, um, you know. And um, um, also, you guys you guys really helped me educationally uh, because I was you know I was able to through a lot of a lot of work but you know figure out kind of obs and stuff and it helped me make some really good presentations so i have a now i have a library of stuff which i didn't have before that's great that's great um brian and then tony so i'd never live streamed before and in july i think it was did a conference for the first time with memo and learned a ton failed in a lot of ways but you know learned a ton all from just sitting in here and doing that and I want to say on behalf of my wife, too, Blair, the silversmith, who's struggling with education and this hands-on education thing. She, for the last two weeks, has been learning Resolve. She started editing and shooting things. We're re she's completely rethinking how her business is being run. Hopefully in January, we'll have a site up where it's all stuff that she has made, which has just not been her thing. So it's, it's radically changed the way she's thinking, and she'll have a new studio in a few days with a bunch of cool cameras and stuff so thank you awesome that's awesome uh tony and then john i just want to say that there are a few amateurs um that think that um they can be they can look professional and that's all thanks to office hours there are a great bit of um educators and small churches that are thankful to office hours because I'm able to help them. And it is only because I've been allowed to hang around with you guys. So appreciate you. And um, I'm going to hang in there until y'all, until y'all put me out. You're doing great. And, so, it's great to have you. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Thank you again, Alex and office hours. Pleasure. All right, go ahead, John. Well, I was just going to say I'm, I'm quote, failing retirement, so I don't do as many productions, but I can say that the uh, office hours not only improved our productions, but it had a much broader reach. It would have been very hard to come up with a focus group of this technical caliber to give feedback to Zoom during those crucial times. Um, th there are lots of people who give suggestions and ideas and have problems, but uh, I know that this group accelerated improvements, pointed out issues that not only we dealt with ourselves, but had a much broader reach. And I, I think we all should congratulate uh, Alex for what he pulled together, but it's the collective mind here that really made things happen. Um, there were some many things I could say that were discovered here or brought up here that would not have been repaired or fixed or dealt with as quickly if this group had not succeeded. And I'm, I'm happy that I got to get it started. I, I do think that the value is in the group, you know, like it's, it's uh, it really is this incredible group that's kind of collected itself, both in the attendees who are asking all the questions and thinking through all those things as, as well as the panel. And I just think that that's a, it's a fascinating model that I haven't seen before. And I don't, I don't, I can't, I'd love to say that I planned it, but I just, you know, it's just kind of self, <laughs> self-formed, Peter, and then Chris. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I kind of fall in between like what Tony said and what Brian said. I mean, I'm an amateur in this space. I, I do video conferencing because I have to for my work, but I also do it for volunteer work. And starting in July, I was able to, using Memo Live and the information I learned here, able to run some volunteer stuff for some STEM education across 
nine time zones um, with about 100 kids. And it, mm -hmm. it worked really well. And, and I just learned something new today or an idea today just from Guy, which is go get myself one of those portals <laughs> so that I can up, up the, uh, the video stream on, my, on what I'm putting out. Because so, I have had some complaints from kids not being able to see what I'm doing, even though I'm using some really high fidelity cameras. Right, right. That's great. Uh, Chris? Uh, I'll just say, Alex, you mentioned something about it's the group. And it and it really is. Uh, I was if you go back, if you don't know, go go back and look at Alex Lindsay's very old YouTube stuff. And there, I, I remember watching these things. You would you would turn it on, and you would just do these tests just by yourself. Mm -hmm. And and I was going, oh, there's Alex again. And and I never stuck around to, to listen to all the things that you were talking about. But it was like, oh, he's doing one of those tests again. What is he doing? Huh? Okay. But but when you throw in the mix of the whole group, I mean, it's yeah. it's it's astonishing the the footprint and the uh, and I tell you the people I work with are so sick and tired of me saying, well, you know, I was talking to my friend in Manila and what he said, or oh, I was talking to my friend up in uh, uh, Seattle and what he yeah. said is uh, this, you know, and Alex Lindsay says, I'm like, ah, shut up with this. Well, and it's it is this it's it's um, it really is centuries of experience spread around the world that are all in one place at one time every day, which is kind of crazy. You know, like it's just, you know, like there's the, that we have a whole bunch of people that have all these different disparate. It, the reason that we answer so many of the questions so effectively is because everyone comes from a slightly different angle and they have different pieces of this and, and it's somehow we're piecing it all together. And again, we keep on hoping that, you know, we just keep on growing it and um, the number of, but the number, we're at a really good space right now where it's come from, I was talking to somebody yesterday, <laughs> I was talking about how much I can't think under a hundred people. Like if, if it's under a hundred people, we've been a couple of Sundays that have dipped on, under a hundred. I'm like, it's so hard because there's just not enough questions. <laughs> like, like you have to keep on asking people for questions and, and uh, it's just, it's just, it's a, it's a heavy lift. And so that as it grows, it feels like we answer the questions better. We ask the questions better. And as a group, you know, add the, the, the hundred, you know, there's about four to 600 uniques across all the different platforms, you know, across the uh, shoutcast and, and, uh, Zoom and YouTube is about four to six hundred uniques a day, and so it's a, it is a, uh, this group is I think just learning faster. Like we just I I do worry that it's hard for people to come in in the middle, you know, just because it's you know there's so so much knowledge that's already kind of known, but that's why we keep on answering the same questions again, is to make sure that that we just keep pulling people in, um, you know, and and you know building this. And I for me one of the other big benefits is finding other people that I'm working with. You know, there's people that are in this panel that are people that have been in the panel and they're form they're slowly forming a large <laughs> portion of my, of my production pipeline. So, so, um, you know, and so it's, and I would have, I would have never known them, you know, I, you know, like I knew, I knew Chris for instance, but I hadn't, uh, you know, I don't know if I would have just called him up to start doing stuff and Mickey, I wouldn't have known at all, you know, and, and Alice Golner again, I knew him, but it's not, not on top of my head. And these are all people that are, you know, and Bill and, and Sky have all done, you know, and so the thing is, is that as that keeps on going, you know, on these productions, it just makes it, you know, you know, there's something about it being in the panel that you know them. Like, you know, you know, like, you know how, how that person, whether, you know, uh, you never know until you're doing the production, but you get this sense of people um, and it's super, you know, uh, powerful. And I know a lot of us have, are doing work together. It's not just me. It's like a lot of us are cross pollinating all the time and hiring each other. And we all hire Tucker. <laughs> There's like, there's like that. Tucker, like, Tucker I was is just the talking about Tucker. Pin. Yeah, Tucker, Tucker, he's the, he's the, he's the big winner out of this. <laughs> yeah. And, and someone was saying, this is like, someone said, this is like, you're like, cause you, you, I, I just called, like, I, I, I looked so good a couple of weeks ago. I was at a, uh, we were working on comms and the comms were not working and it was just a big mess. And I just told the guy, I said, you know, like, Hey, we just need to get, we just need to get, um, get on the unity, get on a unity server. That's external. We'll just have a guy. I know a guy you know, I know a guy that can make this just go away, you know, and it'll just be all the comms will be working in half an hour. In a half an hour, all the comms are working. I mean, like it went from disaster to everything's working, you know, and it costs like, you know, Tucker, I always feel bad. I always feel like you should charge me more for that. Anyway, so, so, um, uh, so it just, poof, it was all done. And, um, but, you know, and, and so one of the guys that was on, on the set, he's like, you're like part of the media mafia, aren't you? You're like, you, you just know, you, you know, guy, you know, I know a guy down there. He's going to make it go away. You know, the, the, the whole thing is going to be over, you know, you know, His and company uh, and, name should be just call Tucker. 
<laughs> Call Tucker, you know. Uh, but I was just talking with someone else. I was like, they were, they, they, oh, we're getting into Unity. And I was like, so like you can do this yourself, but you can just have Tucker sort this out for you. So, and and I think I, Tucker will have to correct me, but I don't. I think that Tucker got into Unity when we did the Dalai Lama project. So the I think that he. It's not like he had done this for years. We did a project that required him to learn Unity, and then he just kind of Tuckerized it, <laughs> dug dug into it, and you know, and so so it's um it was a. A uh, very interesting, interesting thing. Go ahead, Greg. Can I just ask because I don't even know how did Mickey get involved? How did you get involved? Mickey showed up when Mickey first started showing up. Like he wouldn't turn his camera on. He w- yeah, he was no. Not you there. you don't there, want my camera on. I'm just sitting here he smoking, was smoking in the dark. Yeah. <laughs> so Mickey, how did you find out about this? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I I've been watching Mac Break since okay. Mac Break. Um. Um. And then. I rarely use Twitter. I only only use Twitter when I need to check on news. Uh, so I use Twitter to read the news. And then I saw t- a tweet from you, Alex. Hey, I'm making this little meeting on Zoom. Like I've only used Zoom maybe like, you know, less than 10 times and before that. Uh, and okay, download Zoom, check it out. Okay, a bunch of nerds like me talking about tech. Sounds like fun. I'll <laughs> stick around for a couple of days. And then here we here we are. <laughs> <laughs> that's great that's great yeah so it's uh and it, it's and and it's i think that what i like about it is the way it grew you know because we're not doing you know because it's everyone just tells other people about it in general that we just end up with a very uh cohesive group you know that that i think is really really interesting so, this is anyway. really this has really been the hey i'm going on a ride on a ferry you should go with me experience <laughs> 274 yeah. days yeah and, and, and again, it, you know, what I'm excited about is the fact that it is 274 days straight, even when I couldn't come. And we've had great support from, from Bill and Chris and Phil and Guy and other folks that have, you know, have worked on the questions and, you know, obviously Mickey cutting the show. And, you know, it's, it's a team effort. It's really a team effort. And I, you know, I open the doors at 5 a.m., but then I have a meeting at 5.15. So I, I get, you know, open the doors at 5 a.m. and people, you know, come in and mosey on in. And then I go do my meeting and I come back and, you know, and there's, you know, I can come and go in the, in those early days. Um, and even if I need to let yesterday, I had to leave early to get to, to, a, um, an event. And so the, all of those things are, um, you know, that we've built something that we are doing, you know, it's not, not me, which is exciting. And it gets to be more, more we every day, which is, which is great. Um, next question. Uh, we've got Jonas to tell, and I'm just going to say we've got a bunch of questions because we had so we're much gonna fun run. and enjoyed that. So I know we, we had a fun. It's, it's right before Christmas. Uh, we're going to run uh, a little heavy. We'll, we'll run a little heavy because we don't have a ton of second question, second hour questions uh, that are video based. So we'll just keep we'll just keep answering the questions. Anyway, next question. Okay, Jonas to tell of Reutlingen is in with. Uh, can someone who has used Google? Uh, is there someone out there who's used Google Auto Flip to create 69, 16 by nine videos? out of nine by 16 videos so, yeah because it says create nine by 16 videos out of nine by 16 videos which is super easy it's just <laughs> <that's right. laughs> Done. but yeah i imagine convert from one to the other um anybody done that we might have gotten stumped haven't done it well specifically using google auto flip right. that must be some menu choice no i think it's a little a web app or something or maybe it's a hmm. is it a, or is it a uh Open source framework for intelligent video stream reframing. Yeah, it's just reframing. It's it'd be interesting to test all of these, whether it's this one or Final Cuts. You know, there's a lot of things that are people are working on to try to. It's like a pan and scan, out. huh? Yeah, I mean, it is. It's valid because when you're when you're watching really short form, you really do want it to be nine by sixteen because you don't want to keep on turning your phone, um, and it is easier to hold and watch. I get it. Um, and and in some ways, I think it actually is more. Uh, personal when you have a person addressing you in nine by 16, it just, it does feel a little closer and you don't have to worry about the background. It's not as much of a distraction, but for most things, I still would prefer 16 by nine. Anyway, next question. Paul Wallace of Austin, Texas is in with, is there a recommendation, a recommended USB extension cable, either powered or passive? So a brand. Um, I think the one that I've used most recently is the Geffen makes a USB power extender. They're not cheap. The pair is like 450 bucks, but it is hundreds of feet. 
like it's not like 15 feet longer it's hundreds of feet um you know and we have found that to work reliably um there's a more modular ones that we've used that are more expensive <laughs> but but those are those are the ones the last time i put in my office i had to run i had to control a wacom tablet from 200 feet away you know and had to have that interface working and it worked perfectly oh, go ahead chris i can't hear you chris muted yeah 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 uh i re i recently had to extend some uh, a really long usb run and I used a little adapter actually that changed it into Ethernet. And I could put one on each end of the, ca the Ethernet cable. Well, and that's what the Geffen one is, is over Ethernet. Oh, it's extending sure. over Ethernet, but it, it is, uh, it's just very reliable and very long distance. You figured um, me out. I just wanted to hear myself talk. That's okay. <laughs> it's not over network though. That, that, the ones that I'm talking about are not net IP. So there are versions that I haven't, we have used, but I haven't used recently that are IP driven so that they will run over a network. And most importantly, they'll run over the internet. Why would you want to run over the internet? Well, what you can do if you're feeling crazy is you can put a DSAN perfect queue at a client's location and connect it and have it literally take USB all the way to your computer and switch, switch the slides while they're, um, they can actually still use their little perfect queue. Cause some, some, uh, of our presenters really want their perfect queue. Like they, they're, they've been using the same thing for a long time. Um, and I don't know how, these might, these might work really well. I don't know how well they work. What's the range on oh, 328 feet? Be worth testing. Yeah, what I ended up doing was um, I needed to have a keyboard in one room and three rooms down the hall have the computer that I was switching between gallery and speaker view on Zoom. I was doing it on two separate Zoom rooms, so I had two keyboards next to my production switcher. Hey, go ahead, uh, Jeff Francis. I think if you need to be like 15 feet extension or less, you can use a passive male to female cable. If you need to be, you know, sort of in the room, but longer than that, you can use an active USB cable. Then if you got to go down the hall like Chris did, then something over Cat5, Cat6 cable. And then if you need to go across the world, then you need IP extension. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's good. It's a good description of that. Um, next question. Oh, go ahead, Peter. Well, I was just simply going to say that uh, what what was just said is, I know I have a PTZ camera that's sitting on a twenty foot five foot cable, but the only reason it works is both ends are powered. Right. Yeah. The PTZ camera itself is putting out a powered signal, so it's not relying upon the computer to amplify the signal. It's strong enough at its own. Yeah, we, 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 uh, definitely all the ones I've used are powered. Yeah. They need, they require power to, to make that work. The, um, I'm trying to find the one that I was, that we use They're they're out of their local here, but they, they're great because they have modular setups. You can just have little cards. You can say, Oh, I want you. It's, I got one fiber connection or two, like two single modes that go into it. And then you just put in the USB and the RS-232 and the, you know, you put a whole bunch of them in there and then they just pass all that data to the other side and spit it out. They're more expensive, but they're they're really cool, and they're used in broadcast trucks to connect the EVS operator to the EBS itself, and that type of thing. So they're like rock solid, you know, for for that type of thing. Uh, go ahead, Sky. I think those are called KVM switches. No, no, is, no. These no, are they're not? this is a whole different world. Yeah, this is not a KVM switch. This is passing you have modular uh, cards that you put in, and there and this cool. one will take RS two thirty two and spit it out the other side. It, it, this one will take uh, USB and spit it out the other side. So you can have like three or four different things that you want to put into yeah. the into the box, and then it takes all that and just transports it over fiber. And on the other end, it spits it back out. Super low latency, high reliability. Yeah. But they're like, I mean, these are like, just I'm saying it just so you know it exists. If you're building something and you really need, you know, I use the Geffen the Geffen ones for the USB, <laughs> but yes. just to let you know that there are these, and I'm trying to find what it is, but it's uh, yeah, and Geffen, they're like a couple grand. Like they're not, they're not like, you know, it's not like a $45 solution. It's no, but, Geffen, Geffen and Everts both have been around for a long time doing this for a long time. But this is a little company in Alameda that does it. And we, we've only found about it because we were working with EBS and they were like, this is how you connect an EBS operator to an EBS over a truck is this box. And that's the only one EBS will let you use. Um, so anyway, next question. Michael Fisk in Spokane Valley is interested. He's recording time last files with a Brino TLC 200 Pro. They're in AVI format and he can't import nor open them in any Mac programs. And I looked up that is that this camera. Um, what is a solution, please? 
and Troy Bryant mm-hmm. and then Stewart. Shutter and coder. Swiss Army knife. It does it. Yep. Um, that's all I was going to say. Uh, go ahead, Stuart. Okay. AVI is a Microsoft format. It stands for Audio Video Interleave, and it is ancient. And it's basically just the wrapper that all the different codecs are inside. Uh, VLC will open it, and VLC will open it on a Mac. Uh, so will Handbrake. And on a Mac, Handbrake is probably your best solution for that. All right. Next question. Oh, good, Bill. Oh. Bill, and then the next question. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to note that, and Stuart touched on it. it the wrappers, as opposed to codec themselves, there's a little tool called Media Info in the Mac, and I'm pretty sure there's a uh, PC equivalent, that if you drop the actual video file on, it'll dig down and figure out what the actual codec used on that is, and at least that'll give you a start to figuring out whether something will parse it and get it open for you. Okay, moving along to Tim Holm of San Lorenzo, who says Huddlecam HD Pro 4K webcam. Is there a Windows 10 app to adjust exposure and shading and so forth? The included menu settings are not that great for him. This has been a problem on the PC is that we haven't had a lot of good webcam, uh, webcam controls. Go ahead, Andy. Do you know if that's a UVC compatible webcam? Uh, because if it is, uh, OBS has a settings menu um, and can interface with it. It is. I mean, it, I, the huddle cams will, I know that we can do it on right. the Mac. So it's, it's just, so I think what they're trying to find is an app that is just, just the camera control as opposed to opening up OBS to control it, but you could well, do that. Because well, if, if you needed another app to share it, you could, you could set the settings in OBS as though it were a camera control app and then send the, you know, the video elsewhere. Right. Yeah. Good. Oh, yes. <laughs> this is probably this is good. Tony? Today I'm using webcam adjust. It seems to be um, extremely good. Is that and Windows I, or Mac? It is, it is Mac, mm-hmm. but I believe that there is a Windows version of it. Okay. That's great. Yeah, because because the Mac, there's a lot of different solutions for it. What's funny is, is that there's tons of solutions to affect your camera from the Mac side, uh, but you can't affect your internal camera if you have a Mac, I think 2018 or later, it'll turn yeah. gray. Yeah, so Mac has all the solutions for external cameras, but you can't literally can't touch the internal camera. You have to restart your computer if you turn it on. Um, and then the Windows, you could do anything, but you don't have any apps. It's very, it's very odd uh, mismatch there. Next question. Moving along to Scott Wasserman of Detroit, Michigan, who asks, the number of various cables, adapters, and so forth that I've gathered over the past year has greatly increased. We feel your pain. Does anyone have an organizational system they're proud of to share? And, and make sure wall warts are in. <laughs> I have, some, I have some cables. I've had to organize a lot of cables. Um, and uh, I'll give you a couple things that I've done and then let someone else, while, while everyone thinks through that stuff. So... One is, is that anything less than six feet, I, I put little, um, you can get these things that go again in the wall that have slots in them. And you basically, I put them along. And so anything less than six feet, I just hang them, you know, from those from on, on a wall um, or on some kind of board or, or something. And the reason I do that is so that they don't get all, they don't get all rolled up. The last, last, last line, which is easier to grab them and know what length they are and just pull them out. And so I'll usually have a whole wall or a whole PDF. Yeah, there you go. Chris is showing what those, I don't know what they're called. I just know what they are. A mountable cable hanger. Um, anyway, so I use those a lot um, to keep my anything less than six feet. Um, the uh, anything over six feet, I put labels on. If I'm going to roll it up, I put, a, I put one label right at the uh, where the connector is. And I put another, another, another connect, another co- uh, label somewhere down the, the spine that tells me where to roll it. So when I roll it o- over, it means that all of the 10 foot ones will be exactly the same size and all the five foot ones will be exactly the same size. And I define that by how far those labels are apart from each other. Um, and so they, so they, 25s are a certain size, 10s are another size and fives are another, or not fives, but eights or whatever. So 10, 15, 25, 50 are all different sizes. And most importantly, they all fit inside of each other. So you can, if you're, in, if you're loading a case, you can drop a 50 foot cable and a 25 it's like inside Russian of it. dolls. It's totally like <laughs> Russian dolls. So, but you, you can drop them in. Um, so you can go 25, uh, 15, 10. And uh, anyway, so you put those on those and that way you can, they're, you're always rolling them. You don't have to think about it. You just roll them and they all turn out that size. They also look really nice. If you hang them, I put hangers out and you hang them on the wall. 
again, they look, they look very nice because they're all the same color. I mean, no, they're all the same size. It's, it's, uh, it's very pleasing, especially when a client walks in. They're like, wow, clients are funny. <laughs> they'll look at something, and they'll just be like, wow, that's impressive. They don't know why. It just looks so different than anything else they've seen. And, and it, it, it gets you work. Like, just in case you're wondering, like weird things that are highly ordered get you work. Um, anyway, so, um, so anyway, so that's how I have them rolled. Now, what I did, and I showed this picture a while ago, I'll see if I can find it while the people are talking just to put it back up. But I built cable boats. Um, I designed them and had some friends build them. I didn't build them. You'll like these, Chris. It's a big boat that has the hanging on either side. So, and, and then it has these, these uh, buckets on the bottom to put the big heavy ones in. And it, it was on casters. And so you just roll it around. So what I had is I had one that was all IP. So all the USB, Ethernet, whatever. Then another one was all audio. Another one was all video. And when you're building a kit, in the warehouse, you just pull all the, all the cables that you need over to it. <laughs> you, just, you just roll them over in these cable boats. And, uh, and then you just, everything's arm length. You don't have to walk around. And then you just move them to the next thing you're doing. Um, it was convenient. Anyway, so I'll get out of the way and I'll see if I can find that photo. Bill, TJ, and Jeffrey. So I just wanted to add that cable hangers are a fabulous thing. I also use this guy a lot, and it's just particular for me. When I There are some cables I have that always get used with an adapter. So the fact that it has two little trays on the side means I can take that cable, hang it up, and put that adapter in the little tray on the side, and then they always stay in the same area because I don't want to go to one place to get the cable and have to go to another place to get the adapter. That's my two cents. So okay. who is next, Jeffrey? TJ? TJ, oh, thanks. I'm going to recommend that everybody get themselves a silver Sharpie. And anytime you get a piece of hardware, you write the name of the hardware that that power adapter goes to because they're not made by the same company. They're made by who knows what. And you will never remember when you're looking at a pile of them, what belongs to what piece and of And TJ equipment. for the win. I, I will and, say that uh, – uh, uh, I'll go a little further and say I, I get um, I use my little uh, brother, the little cube plus uh, labeler, which is outside of my range of reach at the moment, which is unusual. But um, this little cube that connects to your phone. Yeah, there it is there. Chris has one and Sky has one that's a little bit more manual. This one just connects to your phone and I print not only uh, what it goes to. Um, I, I don't like um, anybody who works for me will tell you that I do not like handwriting. I probably got a bad handwriting. I don't like handwriting on anything. Like I, everything has to be printed out. So that's why I have a labeler. I, I don't like handwriting. And so, so I will, um, I'll print uh, what it goes to and I'll put my name on it. <laughs> you know, I, I, uh, I, I put my name on everything. Go ahead, uh, uh, Jeffrey. Yeah, TJ kind of stole mine because I was going to have my Sharpie there. Uh, silver Sharpie, bronze Sharpie also works as well. I don't like the labels because they seem to peel off. Uh, from the warts. And also, if you've got a device that has a MAC address to it, you can actually write the MAC address on the wall wart so you don't have to go on the underside of a camera to try and figure it out. The other thing is Velcro, and uh, they have these awesome little rolls of Velcro that uh, will loop upon themselves. So you can, uh, you can kind of organize by that. And they also have Velcro in different colors. So you can have ca cables color coded for different things. Yeah, Velcro is a key thing. Go ahead, Stephen. And then One thing start. about when you wrap cables like that and get them all to fit, you can get like 400 pounds of cables in a small box. Yeah, that is the, the, one, <laughs> the one problem with it is, is that there's no air. You have to be very careful of not creating what we call widow makers, uh, you know, uh, uh, cases, which are just, you know, just annihilating. Um, and so uh, you know, Stephen has seen what happens when you, you get good at that. Uh, go ahead, Stuart. And then Greg. And this, kids, is what we call being on the spectrum, and most polymaths are on there. We all have processes for organizing everything like that. It's useful if you manage it, but please don't overdo it. Otherwise, you become someone like Arnold J. Rimmer, and I urge everyone to look up Red Dwarf and see the flip side. <laughs> uh, go ahead, um, uh, Greg, and then Chris, and then Jeff. Uh, I have a fairly cheap solution for adapters, which I have about a thousand of, and I just I just recycle some of these old. This one is a um, American uh, potato salad uh, case, and I use I use the, the large size. This is, this has all my uh, adapters, but but they're clear. You can see right through them. You know, you don't even have to put labels on. Then I have a small little. This is a coleslaw, by the way, Eldorado brand. Nice, huh? 
so you can, you know, for the little, the little stuff. I've got tons, you know, but it's cheap. And you're recycling. Yep. Uh, go ahead, Chris, and then Jeff. Uh, somebody mentioned density. Uh, uh, it was uh, Stephen mentioned the density of the cables in the box. I arrived at the airport with a with a um, the people I was working for. They sent me with a package at the airport, and I put it on the scale, and it was too heavy. And I called the office. I go, "What did you put in this case?" And he goes, "Oh, yeah, uh, open it up." And I opened it up, and he had literally put a brick in the case just to put it over the scale to screw with me. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Uh, go ahead, Jeff, and then uh, Brian. I like the uh, Tupperware with lid, uh, about shoebox size for storing all kinds of uh, extra things and uh, wall warts and all that stuff. And to get back to your point of why you get more work from those clients is they walk in and they see your organization and they know immediately, even if they don't know it intellectually, they know it in intuitively that you care. And that you will I, take care of every detail. And I, that speaks uh, volumes. I got a, I, I made a wiring diagram for one company about how I was going to build their system. And I have a weird thing about white space, if you guys haven't known, if I haven't mentioned it before, but I'm very specific about, like, I can't handle like wiring diagrams with different white space between the lines. And so I'm very like, I'll sit there and I'll do a whole wiring diagram and then I'll just spend the last 10 minutes just going sometimes it's the last half an hour <laughs> sitting there like fixing all the fixing all the things so it all looks good um and i i was mentioning that to someone who now is working with me that 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 i that hired me and i and i was like yeah i do that i do that weird thing i don't think anyone notices he goes oh we all noticed <laughs> he goes he goes that was a point of discussion like that was a, that was like a contributing factor that we, we just knew we hired the right person we saw all, all you know all that perfect little thing that you're paying attention to all these little details because then you'll pay attention to our little details you know that's the to, to, to your point uh, brian just i was wondering greg can you tell what kind of adapter you're getting by how they smell in the dark with those containers <laughs> uh go ahead you, uh, you don't want to uh, know that <laughs> go ahead uh stewart one bonus point um if instead of using silver for your sharpie or your labels you use pink everything becomes theft proof <laughs> it will not walk off of a set by itself that's good that's good uh, here's the by the way it, it's it's kind of off in the distance there's probably a couple things to talk about here but um you can see the cable boats uh right here so this is the stuff that we built uh around these and so these are the boards and i think in this case it was up to three feet and so the those those racks are across the top and then it was a spine and then these are big we put the heavier stuff down below here um, this is when we were, we were doing R&D and building something. But you can see, you know, we built a wall against one of these things just to separate the room. The other cool thing about this is not cable related is if you look at all of these guys up here and as they're all these um, things being stored, what we did is we built a um, we built these little wooden racks that had uh, shelving that was one U wide um, because we were constantly pulling things out and then we put we put felt on either side of them and then we and then it was like a, it would hold like 10 at a time but because the shelving would pull out you could then put a one u in but if you had a two u you pull the shelving you'd slide the shelving out it was all wood and stuff like that but you just pull the shelving out and put a two u in or a four u or a five u and you just pull the slots out then it'd be a little bit of extra room on, on those but with the bigger ones it was easier to grab onto them um and we store we had probably 10 of those that were 10 each and hold 100 u of random gear that we had to kind of put there but i like my, one of my favorite stores is container store just in case you're wondering go ahead uh tj one other thing similar to greg's uh idea is you can use zip top bags to combine like items together so you know i've got uh, some screw adapters <clears throat> and other ends here um, that works for anything even up to uh, including when you take a car apart <laughs> and I was trying to find one if I, I thought I had one laying here, but I, um, metal mesh makeup bags are great. You can buy them, you know, for seven bucks each on Amazon or whatever you can get them. And, and they're just these nice little bags that come in slightly different sizes. And I put all my adapters and little cables in them. It's, they're very useful. Yep. Yep. There you go. 
Um, it's great. All right. <laughs> only, only here can you talk about a bunch of really high-end electronics. And then if you ask the question of how do you manage your wires, everyone gets really passionate. Like, oh, me, me, me. I, 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 have, a, I have a solution. Uh, anyway, <laughs> it's OCD or us. Anyway, um, next, next question. Well, and I don't think I've seen this questioner before in this uh, particular format. It's Alex L. from Nevada, California says, I'm trying to isolate a frequency or set of frequencies in an audio stream and use the levels within these frequencies to control color and intensity of lights. Uh, go ahead, Andy. Are you opposed to using an Arduino? Because the, the first piece of uh, Not at all. software I ever made was this exact thing. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, it, absolutely. How convenient. Because I um, I got an Arduino. There's an FFT library. So you do a Fourier transform and an Arduino shield. You get the spectral yep. view. Then you just DMX out based on the spectral view mm -hmm. of each of the, and you can pull the intensities. It's a great so, library. So the thing that, that I was trying to figure out with that the specifically is being able to create a bunch of, the Arduino is great and I could definitely do it. And, and that would be probably my first pass at it. The, the question that I had was related to that is that I want to be able to get it into software where I'm identifying it and I'm identifying that, but then I can build a bunch of, and I could probably do it in Arduino as well, to your point, but have it be like, when it gets above this, but below this, when it, you know, like and set up a bunch of mm -hmm. dependencies and possibly set up relationships between them so that they, you know, so, so basically what I'm doing is I'm going and grabbing slivers of, of, of frequencies along that, that piece. Let's say someone's playing the drums, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm grabbing onto different drums um, and I'm grabbing onto a bass and I'm grabbing onto possible notes and I want to drive all the lights based on the, on that, on that piece. And I was just trying to think, I mean, I've done pieces of it, but I, the way I thought about it was I, I wrote a program in Java that um, the Arduino would then listen to. And so I, I showed the Fourier transform and then you could click and drag color into it and design it right on the spectral view and assign right. lighting to parts of that. And it was for, this was for computer fans, right? When RGB mm -hmm. fans were just starting to come out, um, there wasn't a lot of control software for it. And that, and, and so I just would wave into that and then I would serialize out mm -hmm. the data, but that way you had a GUI to be able to. Set it all is there up. any is there any combination of existing software that would do it? Because I'm trying to do this in the next <laughs> right. little bit of time. So sorry. Is there anything that I wouldn't have to write? Is the question, or or do I have to write it? That you, you going out to, are you going out to DMX or do you need? Um, uh, I would like to go out to DMX. Maybe I can share something with you. I'll I'll take a look. See okay. what that what condition that code is in. <laughs> okay. Okay. Anyone else have any other ideas around that? It's, it's a unique thing that I'm trying to figure out that I'm playing with. And, you know, I, um, I know we can identify those things because if you look at, uh, you look at something that'll analyze the audio and logic or whatever, it'll just grab all the notes, you know, like it, it can, it knows what it's looking at. And then I just need to know what the volume is to control the intensity and possibly the color of the light based on the, just the level and free uh, level within that frequency. So, um, and I was trying to think of just kind of a quick software solution to do that. Like where I just have a, you know, is there a piece of like, does QLab do that hidden somewhere or, or does something else do that? And I, like, I just couldn't, well, I could, I, I didn't think about it at all because we have office hours. <laughs> so I, I thought about it yesterday, like that would be cool. And then I was like, I'm, I just wrote it down. I just, I did exactly what I tell you to do every, everybody to do every morning. I was like, I'll forget that question. I was in a meeting and I literally just went, oh, this would be really cool. And then I just wrote the question down. I figured, well, I'll solve it tomorrow morning. <laughs> like, you know, we'll, we'll figure it out. Uh, go ahead, Jeff. Do you want the intensity of a frequency of a particular frequency of audio to change the intensity of a particular color of light? Is, is that, it that simple of a mapping? Uh, yeah, yeah, but I want to be able to, yes, in, in its most simple form, I want, and more, more of what I want is less of the light. I mean, the color of the light is gravy. It's the intensity of the light is being controlled by a specific frequency of audio. So it goes in and it says, I want, I want a sample between, uh, 1000 Hertz and 1100 Hertz. And I want to drive the light intensity based on the, you know, the, the, uh, vol volume or the, 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 uh, based on that with only within that little area. So you, if you can imagine that, you know, and, and again, I think that some of the things we see in software, like quartz composer used to do this, where you'd feed it in and it just starts doing things to the music. That's what it's doing, right? It's doing things. It's, it's transforming color and, and intensity and everything else based on the music. I just want to do it to physical lights, you know, to, you know, so I want to convert that information back to DMX. 
is the is what I'm trying to figure out. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I don't. I was thinking spectrum analyzers, and most of the analyses have them in will display it, but it's that taking a visual cue and mapping it to a control signal that. I don't know how to make that. Well, it doesn't jump. have to do a map it to a control signal. It just has to map it to a number. So it just has to say in this, I mean, because once it, it has to get to a number that can send it back out. And once it gets it out, you can send it into a lot of other things. You know, you just have to get a value coming out. The value in, in this frequency is this, which is showing up on the graph. But I need to be able to grab that number and po and post it. And then whether it's OSC or, 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 you know, there's all kinds of things we could do to process that, that data once we just have data, like inside of this frequency, there is this thing. And then what you may want to do, the reason I kind of want to have it in a piece of software that theoretically an audio piece of software, because I might, or, or I have to pa pass it through hijack or something like that, is that I may want to do pre-processing before it makes that decision. So I may want to run it through and then do a whole bunch of EQ on it, do a bunch of other things, you know, do a pinch, do a whatever I'm going to do. So I'm just grabbing onto that. And, and accentuating things that I'm interested in as well. So there may be a bunch of pre-processing that needs to be done before it goes into the process of where it decides on the lights. Go ahead, Jeff, and then, and then Mickey. And that could happen in between. It could happen in a couple of different places. Maybe take a look. I've never used it. I actually just found it when I was Googling about your DMX or uh, the Artnet question earlier, uh, lightjams.com. Okay. They have a music to DMX. Oh, okay. Uh, Mickey? Uh, I would maybe take a look at or maybe have uh, Chris Peterson or someone who knows coding take a look at uh, Blue Cat Audio. Um, it's a, it's a, an, a plugins platform that also has some um, scripting. Blue Cap or Blue can... Cat? Blue Cat as in meow. Um, <laughs> meow. Meow, yeah. Um, and yeah, uh, they have a scripting platform on it wherein I would assume you can get you can pull some information out of out of mm -hmm. frequencies I, I don't know exactly how it how it works but i know people play a lot uh, with it yeah that's great uh go ahead greg and then andy i'm i'm just wondering if you couldn't do some kind of extreme slope high pass low pass deal over a bunch of oxes and then send the output of each of the oxes Oh because yeah, it would be. It would just be the level of that. Then, then slice. it's just the level. Then it's just converting the the. You're doing all the pre process work, and just the only thing left is that level. And then well, that's you, what you want, right? Yeah, yeah, that could work. That could work. But yeah. how do you t turn that into actual numerals, though? Actual. Like, well, now you numbers. have to. It's easier to turn volume into uh, the volume into a numeral than it is to change what we. It's a good way to slice it. Is to is to just say I'm going to do all the processing in that and then i i still need to figure out how to get the number out but the number's there go ahead andy so light jams can do it in like six clicks you you <laughs> yeah there you <laughs> go. i have it i have it over here it's hard to see it i i just um i didn't set up the virtual input but um you you see at the bottom of your screen here is a, a spectral view you cl you literally click on one of the spectrum slices and then on top left you can set it to power range color whatever you wanted to do and then we'll convert it to DMX for universe and shoot it out. <laughs> yeah, that's a great okay. suggestion. Yeah, light jams for the is easy. But, but, yeah. but this is the power. This is the power of of of, uh, of of all of us thinking about it for a little while because literally I didn't. I was in a meeting. I didn't even have time to to think about the research of it and I was like I'm not going to even. I'm not going to even bother. Like, like the thing is, is like, like those, this will take me an hour or two. And I probably would have never gotten to that solution. And the, what's funny is, is the chain reaction of Jeff saw it because of another question, you know, that was, you know, that, that we were having another relation, but it's, it's the power of a, of, of the, the, the hive, you know, like the, there's a whole bunch of people thinking about it all at one time, but I knew that I could just like ask the question. And, and then I was afraid that it wasn't going to get voted up. I was afraid we would run out of time. I was like, no one's voting my question up. Anyway, so, um, all right, the next, next question. <laughs> Moving on to James Bavitt of San Diego. Guy mentioned using a Facebook portal to raise the resolution of a Zoom meeting. Does this work with any Facebook portal or does it require the more expensive Facebook portal plus? Uh, go ahead, Guy. Tested it with this one, tested it with this one, tested it with the one downstairs, they all work. Uh, except great. for the Portal TV, which I didn't buy because it doesn't work. Uh, that one doesn't run the Zoom software yet. Got it. There you go. Next question. 
Uh, Tony Mobley of Newman, Georgia, our friend, says, has anyone tried the Filmic Pro Update 10-bit Log V3? This seems like a game changer to me. Um, I should... I, I have the camera for it. I've been shooting the extreme, but I don't think that's the log V3. I think that's still shooting in uh, vision. So um, I, I should look at the, the map. It's here. a couple of hours old, Alex. Oh, then I it's haven't. A, yeah, it, it's, it's a couple, couple of hours, hours old. Then I know I have. I was like, I'm that it, far behind on a couple hours. <sighs> yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it to me seems like it's a game changer. It's, it is turning your iPhone 12 into a cinematography experience mm -hmm. and it talks about um atmos and it it, it is really powerful it's about seven okay. minutes and it might be something that we want to watch in the after hour show they do the introduction of it and um uh, it's it's serious yeah we'll definitely uh yeah we'll see if someone can play it in we'll, we'll play it into the after hours we'll, oh i can't i won't be here in the after hours but you guys can do that i have to i have a nine o'clock meeting um uh go ahead Stuart. yeah i can probably hang around and play it in okay great sounds good no, next question uh a mitchell's watching has what he determined to be a philosophical question so what happens when the second hour is entitled video and most all questions almost always relate to video anyways how do we decide which ones are second hour or not which part yeah. of video is video and it's yeah. just a curiosity it it the idea was is that we would be able to um uh usually when we do audio only or video only it means that i just I couldn't schedule something specific. I wanted to make sure that there are certain things that even though I have a long list of things I want to talk about in those spa spaces, if I haven't had time to line like an audio one, line the right people up to talk about it, I'm hesitant to just jump into it. Um, you know, cause I want to make sure that we make a good hour of it. And so sometimes I'm just opening it up like, Hey, if you want to add audio questions, you can, um, you're right though, that there's a lot of video questions in there all over that we answer all the time. So and I, I, I've been, it won't happen that often um in uh 2021 uh it's just uh it's a it's a it's a holiday week <laughs> go ahead Stuart. growing pains yep yep you're doing a lot here uh all right moving you'll on notice that there's our... more of those on the weeks on either the week or the week after i have a heavy shoot schedule <laughs> you'll end up with a lot of general discussions <laughs> and so so we're, we're um because uh, i because i scheduled them the week before now we're working on building a bunch of teams for different different days and we're going to start uh i'm going to start working with them to fill january i'm pretty close to figuring that most of january and then starting february i'm hoping to have the teams kind of take that over and then and then we're still figuring out some of the growing pains with related to that and then, and then, you know, obviously we'll, we'll ha be having meetings and there'll be infrastructure. That's what happens. <laughs> bureaucracy. Uh, go ahead, Stuart. Uh, just to directly answer Mr. Mitchell's, well, I'm assuming it's Mr. Forgive me if I get the pronoun correct, incorrect. Um, we don't, the attendees do, and we thank them for their challenge every day. Well, and, and there's a handful of second hour questions uh, that we'll get to at 8.30 no matter what. We'll answer all the second hour ones and we'll go back to the general questions because there weren't that many. Um, we, we also run heavy if there's not that many questions for the second hour. I'll tend to like just allow the other questions to run a little longer. It's a lot of math. I know it looks like we're just answering questions, but there's a lot of like looking at the time. And you'll see me do this weird thing where I'm looking at the time and I'm looking over and that's me going time, number of questions, trying to figure out, looking, scanning the questions, deciding how long I think it'll take to answer them. And when we, when we get into trouble is when I make mistakes in that calculation, because we, you know, spent a lot of time talking about uh, specific things. Next question. Like today we did. I, Ivan of Chicago says, I know we're discussing getting full screen pins of a Zoom room outputs, but I'm working in a corporate environment and don't have access to the back end admin controls. What specific settings can I tell my admin that need to be set to get the cleanest full screen display? Uh, go ahead, uh, Guy. Yeah, I don't see anything in the back end specifically that you would ask them to. So this is the back end besides just uh, making sure that it's on other for, they, they would have to create a profile um, for the Zoom room to set up other other, but you can pin them just fine using the app. So this is why I like to have this thing logged in here because the, one, the ones to be concerned with are this one right here where it says display top banner. This is the controller in the iPad app. So display top banner, turn that off. Um, I don't think you're going to need the gallery view for 49. And then the other thing is change view here options. You turn off this so it doesn't, you know, make these 
other people big over the top of it. So turn that off. And then the other one is in chat. Uh, there's a little thing in the top right, show notifications on TV, turn that off, show show full channel, full chat panel on TV, turn that off as well. Those are the biggies. And then you got to blow it up 105% to get rid of uh, the uh, little microphone icon for mute and unmute and the little Wi-Fi icon. And that should be it. I'm, I don't know if I'm missing anything else. Was there anything else, Alex? That you That's it. Remember? Yep. Yep. Yeah, it just jumps in. And, and we don't see the microphone one for some reason, but we see the connection the, the you know the one that doesn't mean anything that makes us go up to 105 percent. not that i'm bitter all right next next question asha dev of new york city is in with with google cloud print going away end of year anyone have suggestions on how to replace things so that printers are available from anywhere i've heard of this thing printers they like took our screens and then put them on paper. I've heard of this thing. It's I haven't seen it recently, but I've I've heard that it existed somewhere back in the in day. I I don't know. I don't know how to print things. Um, next question. Sorry, I, we just don't have it. Someone I was looking for someone to ask, raise their hand, but we're not we're not a heavy paper group. Next question. Uh, okay, um, this does have a video tag, but it got pushed up there. So I'm, we'll take a shot at it. Uh, video ATA Mini Pro ISO. Is there a difference in what gets recorded between using Blackmagic cameras and using other brands' cameras? See the YouTube link comment, but at Art Last having found only Blackmagic cameras getting recorded. There's a link here, so I'm not sure. Yeah, the link goes to a video from Adam Savage's tested where the uh, where Norm tested the ATM Mini, and it's coming back from a comment that a person made on there, having found deep in the ATM Mini Pro manual that it listed only Blackmagic cameras getting recorded to ISO files, which didn't sound right to me at all. So I suggested that person come and ask the question here, but they haven't yet. I don't know. I don't have an ISO, so I don't, I don't, I don't have a, I don't know if any, maybe someone else here can test it who has an ISO. I don't have yeah, it. Fenwick one, does. I have one downstairs uh, that I brought just to send out. Uh, Paul wanted me to send my fish tank out to his streaming bridge, so I brought one home yesterday. And when I recorded my camera, my Blackmagic 6K, and a computer just for testing, the computer came across as well, so that seems weird. So I was just switching between yeah. laptop, full screen and 6k yeah. and then both the iso files came in so chris has that been your experience too that because you're just taking right uh, computer i'm just output, taking right? yeah i'm just taking the hdmi outputs from the computer or as many as i can get into the iso uh, mm -hmm. what was the specific question you just can't can you record uh, cameras that are not black magic 6ks with the iso will it record them in the iso and it appears that it will yeah, it's anything. Yeah. Just H HDMI in, it'll record yeah. it. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I, I would run into a circumstance. The, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if the person who asked the question is confusing the camera control of Blackmagic yeah. cameras with the recording. Yeah. I think it's quite possible. I've run into a situation where an HDMI didn't appear to the ATEM like an HDMI. For some reason, coming off of a, a strange camera, like something uh, transcoded from USB into an HDMI feed, it didn't like that HDMI feed. So I guess uh, to some extent, all the HDMI feeds might not be exactly equivalent and it might confuse it. Mm. Um, go ahead, TJ, and then we'll move on. Yeah, Victor does this every two weeks. He has one Blackmagic camera and he's got panasonic right. and something else and he's recording isos from that yep, yep. so it, we think it works next question alex olegnowitz of toronto says any suggestions for software for wiring diagrams that will be very dense Ooh, graffle graffle yeah I, I, the i use omni graffle on the mac there's lots of other things to use and and uh, i i know people who use the, the most traditional is autocad on the pc is the most traditional way to build wiring diagrams, but I, I like OmniGraffle. <laughs> so uh, any other suggestions uh, for wiring diagram software? I mean, I've definitely gotten it from other folks that looks cool, but I've, it's the only one I've ever used. Well, not the only one, but the only one I've used in the last decade. Nope. I will uh, say so OmniGraffle is just oddly satisfying to use. It does a great job of auto-connecting things and then allow you to un-auto-connect and you can just tell it straight up all this stuff. <laughs> 
there's rules. I mean, I, I'm building a new list for them of things that I need added for the wiring diagram. But, but there's rules that I wish I had. Like I could say this is video only, this is power only, this is audio only. You know, like so I, I can't like connect it to things that it can't. And I'd love for it to build lists of how many cables I need. <laughs> like you know, build lists of like after you did it all. Like this is. And then some of the auto running is a little bit. You know, there's some other programs that are a little bit better. Uh, at like, you know, spacing out when, when you're kind of running things, but it, overall it works really well, Peter. I can say our standard inside, um, shall I say, a large outsourcing firm was we used Visio for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Visio is another popular one. And yeah. that's and particularly you if you're on a Windows environment, because OmniGraphle is only on the Mac. Yeah, that doesn't bother me. So, yeah. so if you're if you're on a, if you're on a cross cross platform Visio, it I don't think I don't find Visio as good as on Newgraphle or as pleasing to use. I think it's got all the same tools. It's just not as comfortable to use. It doesn't doesn't little as Bill was saying, just little bits and pieces that just feel nicer. But it definitely works on both platforms. Um, next question. Soundmixer FS Jesse in San Francisco Bay Area says, "Will Zoom OSC work for Zoom Rooms?" So um, we don't have a, uh, like a Zoom Rooms client in the same way that we have a Zoom meeting and webinar client. Uh, I'd be happy to conduct a test, um, but I uh, sort of the philosophy of Zoom OSC is that it, it helps you get the kind of management powers that, are, that, that rooms and things can give you, but in a meeting and webinar setting. Um, we, you know, I think that uh, once we start to get to things like Zoom NDI, Plus the, you know, if you, if you get Zoom NDI, Facebook portal upgrading the meeting to HD and some of this uh, Farpoint audio control stuff that we're working on, I think we'll be able to get a lot of the controls that we like about Zoom rooms through Zoom OSC in a meeting context, but it won't be the same animal. Um, but if you reach out in Discord, I'd be happy to try to conduct a test with, with anyone who wants to play around and try some of these edge cases. Actually, Jesse is back with a second question that is not directly related, but he asks, what is a small form factor switch that will work with four to five full NDI feeds at 1080? I think it's like vMix. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know. I don't know of any, I don't know of any, any, uh, look, the hardware switchers don't tend to be able to do that. You need a software switcher to, to kind of make that work. I think the smallest one would be like the small TriCaster or the, or vmix or you know memo live or os or, you know, obs go ahead mickey and then stewart i'm wondering if jesse's asking about like a network switch that the uh, hat is capable of oh and the i yeah that's that, that could be the case too go ahead stewart well if it's a network switch uh yeah any gigabit switch should be able to do that if it's an actual vision mixer uh, I would have to go look at it for an article on Red Shark with a launch of a camera, but I believe Panasonic were making a desktop sized mm -hmm. NDI switch. And will a one camera. gig switch be enough? Yeah, it will be, right? Because what's the bandwidth on the, the about real 80, NDI? Not... About 80 megabits per second per okay. camera at that's 1080. Great. Yep, that's great. Next question. Dan Huber of Erie, Pennsylvania is up next with Is anyone using an M1 Mac using any iOS apps running on it? Right, go ahead, TJ. Uh, Victor and I are going to test this uh, in the next couple of days. I wrote an iOS app for my company, and I want to see if it works on the Mac. That's great. Um, uh, Tony? I have not, but I will try it today. I think that I, I have to go back and look. We maybe uh, I realized the other day when I was trying to install it on something else that uh, – our, we got a bunch of M1s and we were using a Bluetooth app to control the, to control the uh, 6K camera from, from the M1. I think that's actually an iPad app that the guys installed on there. I don't think it's, I don't think it's a Mac OS app. There's, there's an iPad app that looks exactly like it. And I think the guys might've just, and, and that was something that uh, Jesse and the Kevins were working on. So I have to, I have to figure that out. Did but, it but, work? Yeah, it worked great. Yeah. So we were, we were, I mean, so what we were doing is sending out kits and those kits were complete. We were, um, you'd have like a whole bunch of people like working on someone's a direct address for, for an event. And, uh, we were, we had a black magic six K with a USB, uh, mix pre, um, and an ATEM and a bunch of other things built into a little, what we called the brain and it controlled everything. But through Bluetooth, we were able to, you know, control the camera, all the camera settings that we needed to. <laughs> so we were able to go in there. The only thing we couldn't control was zoom. 
but outside of that it was like we changed the iso and changed all the stuff and we, we actually took the patch out of out into zoom with all the um all the data so you could just see through zoom everybody could see all the settings that were on the, the camera was set to and then we were also able to start and stop the records with wingman so over bluetooth they're all in the same little box so they didn't have to go very far <laughs> but but you could control the camera and and the, the mix pre uh and then we had a we were using a um meraki z 3c or is it M c3 is i think a z3c which has got a uh, modem in it so it's got a little um you can have a modem that didn't work very well but but but, but it, it was there uh, but it's like a little router that tied them back into the into the mothership so we was a vpn connection back worked super well <laughs> anyway next next question comes to us from brett dykus of kansas city missouri and brett asks does anyone know of a windows app that will batch convert audio files in place and put the export file in the same folder as the source file think 10 separate folders of dot wave files converted to dot mp3 while keeping the final output in the source headers source right. folders go ahead sky i i think won't um, adobe encoder do that Oh, there you go. Uh, Com next, Compressor next, does it oh, as good. well. Yeah, it'll it just save the source. It defaults to the source folder. Right. right. Windows. Ahead, what, Windows was the, yeah, was the constraint. Right, right. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I was going Mickey. to say um, Adobe Media Encoder, but also, uh, uh, okay, why am I blanking? The 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 NLE. No, not NLE. The AW. Uh, I'll get back to that. Okay. okay. Uh, next question. Uh, Mike Burns says, I really need help with my Wi-Fi. The Capsule Extreme is outdated and not supported by Apple. I have a large house with six humans, four at home learning. Please explain why mesh is no good. Ubiquity, would that be a good choice? Uh, sounds too fancy. On a budget? Um, go ahead, Mickey. I remember now Reaper. Oh, Reaper, yeah. yeah and absolutely. yeah, a guy just messaged me, and yes, that's a Reaper guy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Tony? I'm not sure this will work, but um, I'm using um, extenders, and they, they seem to work extremely well, and you can wire your devices from the extenders. The, the big thing that we found with mesh, or that I found personally with mesh, is that the jitter is really high and the stability is very low, and that's using Amplify, which is Ubiquiti's uh, public, more, more consumer version, which I got as a test and kept on using. I mean, it's been good enough but I end up with lots of idiosyncrasies. I, for instance, I can't use Wi-Fi. I often tell you not to, but I really can't, even for like fun things, can't do use Wi-Fi to stream uh, from my in my house. I have to really run an ethernet cable to my iPhone. If I want to stream something to Twitter for fun, we, we did some tests and it just kept on dropping. And I realized later it was because of the mesh network. And so yeah, it's been, it's on my list of things to do is just to move all to AP. It, it does work. Um, I have, my house is, covers a lot of ground and, and I have to get, I do have to cover some space. So I, it, the mesh made sense because it was easy, but I would have rather run wires. I mean, I already have wires m most in most of the house. And so I, I uh, was able to, I think I'd rather just put APs in. Um, go ahead, uh, TJ. Here's a really off the wall idea. Would a power ethernet over power line to an access point work to be able to extend your Wi-Fi coverage in a place where you can't get wi new wires run through the wall. It might work. I, I'm a little, I, I always never sure about what I think about ethernet through the, <laughs> through the wire, <laughs> yeah, through, through power lines. Um, so I, and I haven't done that much of it, so I don't have a really strong opinion about it. Uh, go ahead, uh, Stuart. Uh, just quickly pointing out something that's just popped up in the chat of the previous question. Courtney actually makes software that'll do exactly what's in the chat. Or what's in the question oh, there you go contact courtney yeah. all right uh next question okay very highly rated for a late uh, question in the, in the queue james babbitt of san diego says when you were discussing zooming and panning on the brio and huddle cam what's the model and price of the huddle cam a bunch of people wanted to know what is the model name of the 299 version of huddle cam? is it the huddle cam hd is that right uh, guy yeah it is the huddle cam hd and there is another one that it looks exactly the same, and it's NDI. So the one that works with USB is 299, and then the one that is NDI looks just like it, but there is no HDMI port on the back, and there's no USB, and that one is 499. So it just depends on what you want to do. 
But yeah, that's what it looks like. And then it does have the quarter 20 on the bottom and HDMI. So compared to the Brio, it just depends on what you want, but you can see that it's got HDMI USB 3.0. That's cool. So, and then quarter 20. Uh, next question. Which the Brio no. uh, has, right, Chris? You got to just kind of dismantle it a little bit. Yeah, you have to rip the bottom off of it. It it's there. It feels so weird when you do it. it does. You feel like you're going to break the camera. I was looking for my my Brio, but yeah, the Brio, you know, the the the, the hook on it, you pull it like pull it off the off it, and you'll, you'll it'll expose it. I think if you did it a lot, it probably would not work after a while. No, if you were constantly going back and forth, but I think most people. Yeah, there you go. Chris is going to pop pop it off here. Uh, now I now just, I can't remember. Is, pull it. is it this just, part you pull off? Yeah. Yep. See, look at that. Uh, See, I remember it just doing makes you that. feel like it you're going to rip the camera. Me. I don't want to do it. It does feel. There it we go. Like, there you go. So you just pop it out, and there's your quarter twenty. But it's um. Yeah. Yeah, so it's anyway. a little spooky. It's unnerving. Um, next question. James Babbitt of San Diego is back with, there seems to be a wide angle distortion noticeable in some iPhone 10 photos. Is there a tool or process to remove said wide angle distortion? It is a problem. You can't, with, with, the, uh, with the newer cameras, you cannot uh, use that 0.5 for people near, near you or they start looking like, you know, Agnaughton from the Egyptian time with really long heads, you know? So <laughs> if anyone's ever looked at, at, at those, at those uh, mummies, uh, anyway, TJ. Uh, Lightroom can correct some lens distortion um, in, in their software. Uh, I don't know if it will do the extreme wide angle, however. It's really good. The 0.5 is really, really good when you want to take pictures of architecture and you're in a small room and you want to, those things work really well, but the people, it does, it's not it's not a great it's not a good look for anybody yeah go ahead bill uh so does luminar luminar has d d uh shape wide angle lens distortion there was also somebody had i think a canon tool a lookup tool uh and they had the amount you can put in a spherical thing to de-squeeze it i can't remember where i saw it though i'll have to go look and see if i can find it somewhere but there's a formula that's great um next question Moving on to Tony Mobley's question from Newman, Georgia. Do you think that office hours should be called a cord cutters program? I don't know. I don't know, uh, if, we're that connected. I don't know if we're that connected. We still like cords. We uh, talk a lot about Ethernet. Uh, go, ahead, uh, go ahead, Stuart. Mixing this and our question before about um, making sure everything was well organized. Uh, if a piece of equipment has a damaged cable, cut the end off the cable. Yeah. That way it won't accidentally go out in the kit and have somebody else not be able to do that. I will do that. I will do that changed. in a production. I'll do a production. And we get some cable that we've decided that's a bad cable. I, the first thing I do is I'm, I'm like, get. I will not let go of the cable. I'll just hang on to it. And I'll like, get me scissors. Alex, <laughs> you know, just... Alex, I need to apologize. I need to apologize. I was, that was not my intent. I was talking about um, all of the streaming services that I have that I no longer watch. That's nope. what <laughs> yeah we did we sucked up all the uh sucked up all the air oxygen yeah it, it is um the interesting thing about that is that i do believe that what we're doing here points to a different kind of media um where it's more collaborative more conversational and it is driven by what we love you know, like, and when I say love, I mean, what we like, what we love to do. And that could be fly fishing, that could be cooking bread, it could be anything. And I think that what we have proven here is that if we can solve some of the technical issues, so it's actually not painful to watch and listen to, to each other, and we and we create that conversation that it's very compelling, you know, that, that it that we would rather do this than watch. And I think that we're an example of that, um, of that working and imagine if there were a lot of other, other ones. It'd be kind of the end of TV and Facebook and Twitter and all those things. And we wouldn't be so upset because we just mostly talking about things that we're interested in. Anyway, just something to, something to ponder. Uh, I, I think about that a lot. Anyway, uh, next question. Yeah, I, I know if you ask my wife, uh, since I've been on office hours for a long time, the number of cords I own has logarithmically increased. Uh, the number of what you own? <laughs> Oh, the number cords of, that I own. The number of cords. <laughs> you but buy the number a of camera. Shows. You get well, what's three funny is, is that, cords. 
this is pretty much sucks up most of my available time to, 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 to Tony's uh, point because it's pushed all the other stuff around. I don't really watch a lot of anything else. I mean, I, I do occasionally like watch a little bit to, to, you know, to go to, you know, before I go to bed or, or, or a little earlier, whatever, maybe a half an hour, but I don't really have time anymore to, to do that, you know, to, to, to watch like regular TV, maybe on the weekends, but that's about it. And so it is, it is something, again, I think what it points to is that we don't need it to be shiny or, or we do need to be a certain quality to make it, you know, worth, worth it. But if we're talking about things that we're really interested in, you know, it's more compelling than uh, kind of pre-formulated TV, you know, and, and I think that that's pointing to something that's interesting that, you know, hopefully we'll be able to figure out more of. Next question. John M. Gerard in Berkeley asks, I'd like to know if Luma Fusion works on the M1 Mac, although I know you use Final Cut. Has anyone Luma tested Luma Fusion on, on uh, the M1? I think that they were planning to move it there. I don't think that they, I think I don't know if they finished the update or not, but there was I, mean, I, I know that they were planning to update it for the M1. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't they're, have a, they're kind of different beasts. I mean, Luma Fusion is a fabulous tool, but it's a very limited interface to do uh, specific types of small things, whereas Final Cut is a is a is, is a looks simple in particularly set up to look simple in the beginning, but has a huge array of deep tools in rooms that you don't get to at first. Mm -hmm. Like you could spend months in roles alone, learning how to put out uh, stems for, for movies, but somebody else will never touch that and will do mm -hmm. just fine with it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, go, different go approaches. Yeah. Luma fusion is not a uh, iMovie. It is much more robust. It is somewhere in between, but it is it is definitely not iMovie in that simplistic sense of an editor editing system. So it's is it as deep as Final Cut? Maybe not, but it's not a cuts only machine. Next question. Moving to Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. Can Jeffrey Powers show us the cool point tilt zoom camera he got dirt cheap? We we lost Jeffrey second hour. We'll have to do so that again. The answer is yep. no. Yep. Next Sadly. question. Uh, Victor from Brookings, South Dakota. Can current recommendations for cloud backup? All right, go ahead, uh, Brian, and then Stuart, and then TJ, and then we'll move on. Uh, I was only going to point out that Victor dropped out with a uh, snowstorm. He copped a blizzard. So he might need backup? Backblaze. Uh, backblaze. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, TJ? Backblaze. Yep, backblaze. Uh, that's, that seems to be the, whatever everyone, everyone uses. Uh, next question. John Preto in Las Vegas and the panel often, uh, did our group come up with a name for the office hours band yet? Can the group, uh, select a few that we can vote on? Oops. Greg has it. No, go ahead, Greg. Uh, no, we haven't decided on, on anything, uh, anything quite yet. And I think the, um, the floor is still open for, uh, for nominations. So if you wanted to throw something into that, uh, the music. Uh, and the name music. be all binary, ones and zeros. Sorry. <laughs> I, I can't wait to see what the band comes up with. That's all I, that's all I can say is, is I'm, 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 uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. Go ahead, Chris. Did, did you hear about what happened when Elon Musk tried to name his kid? He named uh, his kid a bunch of weird characters and the state of California says you can't you can't do that. You can only use 26 characters and a dash and an apostrophe or something. It doesn't fit in the computer system. Go ahead, uh, Stuart. Yeah. Yeah. Part of that name is for an aircraft, and I'm betting that the kids or the pronunciation is Sasha. <laughs> so it's, it's a whole bunch of stuff. And then you just say Sasha. You could just say Sasha. You know, the, um, of course, you had that. What was the one that they, they did that was... Bob McBoat McBoat face. Um, Bodie McBoat face. Bodie McBoat face. Yes. That's that's what happens when you let the general public, uh, you know, name something. Like we're going to take whatever the top view is. I think they've now moved to we will take something in the top five as opposed to, or we'll take it all as a recommendation uh, as opposed to promising that you're going to name your 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 uh, boat Bodie McBoat I love the, face. I love the boats that catch the um, the SpaceX. You know the 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 barges. They have crazy names too. Miss Stuart Tree knows and that. Miss Chief. Yeah, Miss yeah. Chief, Miss Tree, and Miss Chief. No, one of them is called something like. Of course, of, I love you. Of course, I still <laughs> love you. That's the barge. Of course, I still love you. Yes, yes. 
<laughs> All right. Well, I think this might be the last question for the morning. It is. Leo Mandela in London uh, puts a bow on everything for us this morning with, do you have a recommendation of a service to store videos on cloud and play into Zoom that does not rely on a client's PC and bandwidth? AWS? Uh, yeah, uh, Chris, and then Stuart. It's it's called Call Tucker. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, how do you? Uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Stuart. YouTube just set the video private. Play it when you need it. Yeah, but but there's the whole process of you have to get it into Zoom as a non screen share. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, Doug recently got hired because he had a powerful computer to play a bunch of videos into somebody's meeting. And all he did was what we do all the time. He just didn't use screen share. Right. Yeah. I, I, uh, I use Nimble Live for that well, for, for smaller events all the time. Um, yeah. Next one more question. looks like. Yeah. We had a late, late, it's actually as much a comment as a question. John M. Gerard of Berkeley says, I just wanted to know if Luma Fusion would even run on the M1 being an iPad app since someone else brought up the subject or if someone could test for that. Yeah. I think we can it test for it. I, go ahead, Tony. Uh, Tony? I will I will definitely try to test that today, but I also want to mention that there's a strong rumor going around some of the tech media that the M1s will be on the new generation of iPad Pros, that they will have M1s in them. That's really interesting. That would be fascinating. That would kind be cool. Nice. Yeah, that's kind of frightening. <laughs> in a good way, but, but, but that, that would be a thing. TJ? If the developer has not specifically excluded the app from running on an M1 Mac, it should run. Mm -hmm. Will it run well? That's another question. Right. Uh, one more question. They keep we on. We got a couple of late. Yeah, we got actually we got two late, okay. late, late entries this morning. Uh -huh. Ed Willick of Valley College, New York says, Mickey, I got here a late. So sorry if you covered this earlier, but why the change in the audio meter? Uh, so that goes back well, a couple of weeks. With, with this one that we have now, a little spectrum oh. graph. Um, just because uh, Alex mentioned it early in the show and I thought I threw yep. one up. Uh, I like it. But yeah, here's a. Uh, uh, WLM back. Well, and, and with that one, can you add, can you increase the resolution of the graph of that, of that, uh, uh with this one specifically, no, it, this one's quite a simplistic one. It's just the PAS uh, frequency right. meters, but there, there are others that have more, uh, resolution then. like insight. Uh, I like insight. Yeah. Yeah. We really need to write with the brain trust in here and the people that we know. And I say, we, I have no idea what I'm doing. You, uh, we Chris. need to, we we need to write a, a zap that is just an audio meter that you can just invite into yeah. your meeting. Yeah. No, I did. Be useful. Next question. Must do. Must do. Uh, a. Mitchell's finally, again, refinishes us with, so what other more specific video topics might people like as emergency second hours? So he was in earlier with that thing about it's vi most of what we do is video. Uh, it, it, we could probably figure that out. I mean, I think that the thing, the main thing is that I've been kind of working through that. And, and a lot of it is just logistics of just getting ahead of it. So that I, what I need to do, like, for instance, I want to talk about uh, DMX is a good example. But then when I do DMX, I want to make sure that on that day, Andy and a handful of other people are going to be here, you know, so that we can have a general discussion about DMX. And it, it literally just, I know that a lot of people would show up. I just need to like, that's why I'm kind of trying to build team to talk about like a team that manages Friday. So they go, you know, we talk about it and then somebody goes out and okay, what's the list of people that, that might know that we've got a couple um, that aren't in the panel all the time that know that sub we know that they know that subject. Well, let's have, let's bring them in. Um, and so the idea is to kind of build that up. And, and again, it's been uh, kind of figuring it out. So uh, I don't know if there's an emergency subject other than general questions. Um, and the, the interesting thing is, is that the general questions oftentimes, just so you know from the math, the general questions running two hours oftentimes 
actually does as well or better than than the vertical subjects. We actually get a, lot, a pretty large fall off on the vertical subjects, um, but I still think they're important. So I don't I don't worry too much about general going through the whole the whole thing just because um, our our view, average view time and retention and a whole bunch of other things actually do as well or better. Um, I, I think it's important for us as a group to be able to cover different verticals, and that's why I built those second hours. But um, it's not something I worry about too much. I go ahead, Tony and John. Okay, I just downloaded Luma Fusion. It seems to be fine. Uh, the only issue I'm having is that because I did not um, bring anything over from my old MacBook Pro, the mm -hmm. M1 is completely new. There is no content, but it seems to, it seems to be fine. Okay, there you go, John. Real quick, uh, we're gonna. I gotta close up. Yeah, real quick. Uh, you know, when when we had Ride on as a guest, he could have spoke for another couple hours about color science and color theory and and the visual so spectrum. So right. I'm I'm talking to um Steve Steve Wright about doing some more stuff. Yeah, definitely. And Alexis Herkman and other folks. And so there's a whole bunch of folks around, especially as we start to ramp up on some of the resolve stuff, we're going to definitely bring them in. Uh, it's not a, it's just a matter of just getting the logistics sorted out. Um, I have long lists of things to do. I just have to get to it. <laughs> uh, and again, we just, we're going to kind of spread that, spread that out a little bit over the, over the next uh, little bit of time. Um, and then finally from Roscoe, um, I, this is a, oh, how are we playing video into the meeting? Uh, this is from Laura. Uh, how do we play video into the meeting? Uh, and we're, using everything from OBS to vMix to, to Mimo Live um, to basically act as the, uh, as a video input for, and then you, now you can do play out, you know, they, they just play the video out and they treat uh, zoom treats it as a, as a video input. Anyway, I have to, I, I need a minute before I go into my, I have, I have a set of meetings that go all straight until noon. So I need like three minutes <laughs> before I go. So I'm going to, I'm going to let you guys all, I'm going to, I'm going to jump out of here real quick um, and, uh, and jump into that. And I'll see some of you later. Uh, anyway, um, thank you all. It was a fun morning. We had a lot of good discussion here. And, uh, and we will, uh, I want to very quickly jump out of this and start up the post um, show and then let you guys run with it from there. All right. Thanks. See you soon. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, me too. I got I to bail, but I'll, 